Turn your Bibles tonight to a couple of different places. We'll be in Exodus 32, of course, uh, for our series tonight. But then you can also hold your place in Romans chapter 2. We'll come to that a little bit later on in the message. Excuse me, Romans chapter 5, not chapter 2. Romans chapter 5. And just hold a bookmark there or something like that. And then we'll be in Exodus 32. I hope you brought a Bible tonight. We are a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. And I think you ought to have your Bible in church, I want you to understand that things we talk about do not come from your pastor's mind or heart. They come from God. They come from his word. And so we want you to see that firsthand in the Bible. So let's look at Exodus chapter 32, and we'll be in Romans chapter 5 a little bit later. So as we come to Exodus 32, we've seen that Moses is on his way down from the mountain where he has received the instructions for the tabernacle and the sacrificial system so that Israel as a sinful people can walk in a harmonious, blessed relationship with a holy God. But on his way down, Moses receives word from God that the people have corrupted themselves and polluted themselves horrifically. <laughs> They made a golden calf. They got ahead of God. Instead of waiting on him, they became impulsive. And when they became impulsive, they became deviant. And so they have now turned aside from God's word. They're engaged right now in a wild rave, a wild party centered around pagan worship. And they're trying to mix God's name in with it. And it's just a big old mess. And God's wrath has been kindled against their sin, justifiably so. And God told Moses, step aside. I'm going to wipe them all out and I'm going to start over with you. But Moses interceded on their behalf and mediated. And he appealed to God's grace and God took a step back, took a deep breath and chose rather to respond in grace rather than anger. And now what we're going to see here in the rest of the chapter tonight is what we're calling tonight the path forward from sin. The path forward from sin. So let's look at Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And about this time, you're thinking, Moses, what happened to the grace, man? Well, the reality is when they're up in the mountain, he couldn't see what God was seeing. And when he came down and saw it with his own eyes, his zeal for the Lord waxed hot. And he became justifiably angry because of the way God's glory was being dragged through the mud by his people. And so look at verse number 21. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee, that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, and then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. <laughs> Chill, Moses. I had nothing to do with this. All I did was throw the gold into the fire, and pfft. Ridiculous. Remember before it says that Aaron took a graving instrument and fashioned it with his own hands. Verse 25. When Moses saw that the people were naked... 
For Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. And when you see that word naked there, what it, it, it literally means this, they were running wild. I mean, this, we're not just talking about some kind of worship situation here. We're not talking about just falling down before idols. We're talking about they were engaged in all kinds of immorality and debauchery in this moment. Verse 26, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. He's saying, look, we're not in a place of blessing right now. And for us to be back in a place of blessing, we've got to deal with the sin. That's what he's telling him. Verse 30, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt, forgive their sin. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron had made. We're talking tonight about the path forward from sin. May God bless his word. You can be seated. We'll get into our message tonight. <clears throat> when you're left standing before a pile of ruins, you often are left to ask, how do I go forward from here? I'm thinking about people in Oklahoma who return to their neighborhood after a devastating tornado has brought everything down to ashes, everything down to rubble and destruction. And they're left there just kind of in, in shock. What do I do now? All of our belongings are destroyed. I think about that Marshall fire a few years ago and how after about a week's time, people could finally go back to their neighborhood. And, and many of them, when they returned to their neighborhood, that they found that their entire property was just consumed by fire. Their iron was even melted down or their steel beams melted down and everything was just rubble and ashes. And they realized in that moment, every material possession that I've owned is gone. Pictures, clothes, beds, wedding albums, baby books, jewelry, everything, social security cards, identification, our will, I mean, everything is lost. And in that moment, you're left to just wonder, where do I go from here? How do I even start over? How do I move forward? How can the restoration process even begin? A lot of times, that's how it can feel when your life is wrecked by sin. That when a wife is left in tears after discovering loads of inappropriate material and content on her husband's phone or computer. Or the kids that are breaking down when they receive the news of an affair and an impending divorce. When a church is left devastated because of the moral failure of one of their leaders. When a drunk is left sitting in a jail cell after running his car into a wall. Or when a girl is left alone by a guy who walked out after momentarily using her. See, sin, like a violent storm, leaves behind it a trail of destruction 
pain and ruins. And a lot of times by the end of it, you're left standing there wondering what just happened. How do I even move forward from this, especially when you happen to be the guilty party in this? That sin can just wreak so much havoc on your life that you have no idea how to go on from it, how to get past it, how to move forward in life. Israel has sinned a great sin. And their sin is leaving in its pathway a trail of destruction. In fact, if not for the appeal of Moses to God's grace, it would have left them utterly destroyed and justifiably so because God told them that if anybody was to bow down and worship other gods or make molten gods out of gold and silver and other stones that they were to be put to death. The wages of sin has always been death. And so now they have this path of destruction behind them and, and, and they had promised to God that they were going to commit to obey every single law that he had given them after he led them graciously out of Egyptian slavery. And so quickly in just a mere 40 days, they've turned completely back on their commitment. Now they're immorally frolicking naked, worshiping at the feet of this golden calf. God's wrath was ignited. He thought to wipe out the entire nation and start over with Moses, but because Moses appealed to his grace, God chose rather to forgive. And as Moses now heads down the mount, he sees firsthand the wickedness and the devastation that their sin is leaving in its path. And in this text, he works in a very particular and systematic way that will help Israel move forward from this sin and have a restored relationship with God. And when sin has wreaked havoc on your life, when it has left that trail of devastation in your life, what you need more than anything is a path forward, a path out of that sin and back into a restored relationship with God. And the question is this, how can you move forward in a way that restores your relationship with God. What we find in this text is that before Moses could deal with their relationship with God, he had to deal first with their sin. And dealing with your sin is the first step to getting back to a right relationship with God. The path forward from sin begins with a process we call repentance. And what we find here in the first part of our text is this path to repentance includes, number one, the recognition of sin, number two, the responsibility for sin, and then number three, turning from sin, returning to the Lord from sin. The very first action that Moses uh, takes, it calls Israel to recognize their sin for what it truly is, a severe violation of God's law. We read how Moses was coming down the mountain and in his hands are these two stone tablets that contained the Ten Commandments on them, on each side of them. They were written with the finger of God. And the intent was for these tables of stone to be set in the Ark of the Covenant, as we mentioned before, that it was to be a sign of their relationship with God and their commitment to his law. And so Moses is making his way down the mountain with these stones in hand. And about halfway down, he meets Joshua. And Joshua, as they're making their way down, he says, what is that noise that I hear? It sounds like there's a noise of war in the camp. And when you see that word noise several times here, it literally means a shout or a cry. And Joshua is thinking that, that the people are shouting because an enemy has come in. But as Moses listens a little closer, he says, no, that's not the cry or the shout of those that are victorious, nor is it the cry or the shout of those that are defeated. It's the shout of those that sing. It was a familiar sound to him. 
Most likely when you consider how as soon as the golden calf was made that they came and bowed before and they said, these be thy gods that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. That it takes me back to when they came across the Red Sea and they sang the song of Moses with vibrant singing and shouting and rejoicing. And Miriam led the women in dances there in celebration and worship to the Lord. And as Israel has been this entire time, They've begun singing their own songs, singing their own versions of victory, crying out their own shouts of victory to this golden calf rather than the Lord who truly brought them out. Moses continues down the mountain. And when he gets in sight of the camp, he sees the dancing. He sees the people running wild naked through the camp of God's holy people worshiping before this calf, offering their sacrifices and their praises of devotion to this calf. And Moses' wrath and his anger begins to boil up inside of him. And as he comes down to the edge of that mountain and he goes and looks down at the place where Israel with one voice in one accord said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. The commitment they made. He took those tables of stone and he cast them off that mountain down to the foot of the mountain and the law of God was shattered upon the ground in the very place where they committed to keep it. Moses runs down there into the camp and he grabs that golden calf and he throws it into the fire and it begins to melt down and he begins to take pieces apart and he begins to stomp on them and to hammer them and chisel them and grind it to powder and he takes that powder and he scatters it over their drinking water so that as they drink it, it'll become nothing better than waste. Wow. I'd say Moses is angry. I'd say Moses is a little bit uptight here. What happened to the grace that the man was asking God for? Well, what he saw was this. This is horrific. This is serious. This is severe. So much so that symbolically as he stood there on the mount, he cast those tables down. And the reason he is doing this is in very dramatic and clear fashion. He is showing Israel your sin is a serious problem before God. Your sin is a violation of his law. See, what what Moses is getting at here is in this very dramatic scene. He is telling Israel this, you have sinned a great sin. And the first thing you've got to do to move forward from this sin is recognize it for what it is, a horrendous violation of God's moral law. And the reality is this, that if you are going to be able to move forward from your sin, It begins with coming to a place where you recognize your sin for what it is. That your sin is a clear and plain violation of God's moral law. See, the reality is this. Morality is not relative. That contrary to popular opinion today, it is not up to us in our culture and in our day and time to define what is moral and what is not moral. God has already plainly revealed it to us in his word. That worshiping anyone other than the God of the Bible is immoral. Using God's name or Jesus' name as a byword or a cuss word is immoral. Lying is immoral. Stealing and killing and adultery and lust is immoral. Drunkenness is immoral. God has already laid it out plain and clear for us in his word. And that means that we have no excuse that every single time we violate God's law, we are sinning against God and our sin is very serious. But pastor, what about those people who don't have the Bible? What about those people who have no idea about the moral law of God? Well, understand this. The funny thing is, all around the world, in every single culture, from the time that you're a child, here's what you know. Lying is wrong. Stealing is wrong. Murder 
is wrong. Adultery is wrong. There's not a single culture in the world that deems all of those things as morally acceptable. And Paul gives us some insight in Romans chapter 2 to explain to us that while God gave the Jews the law, when they violate God's law, they are sinning against God. But he goes on to say, but that doesn't leave the Gentiles who are without the law with an excuse because God has recorded his law on their heart. That even by their nature, he has showed them what is morally right and what is morally wrong. And so therefore, Paul says that we are without excuse, whether Jew or Gentile. And so tonight, if you're not a Jew, you have no excuse for sin against God. Because he gave it to you on your heart. And when you violated your conscience, you violated the law that God gave you. And so 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4 tells us this. That sin is the transgression of the law. You know what the word transgression means? It means to cross the line. It means that God has drawn a line in the sand for what's moral and what's immoral. And when you step over that line, you have committed sin. You violated God's law. And we cannot minimize our sin. Our sin is very offensive to God because he is infinitely holy in ways that we cannot comprehend. And God has declared what is right and what is wrong. And when we do what is wrong in his sight, it is so grievous and so offensive to him that he determined that the only just way to deal with sin is through death and eternity in a place called hell. And people would say, what happened to that God of love that we were talking about? This is why I don't like the Old Testament. He's just a mean God who kills people when they sin. No, here's the reality. The wages of sin is death, and it's been that way since Adam and Eve first sinned in the garden. And so instead of accusing God, maybe we need to look at it this way, and I've said this many times in our church before, that the severity of the punishment that God hands down to man speaks to the severity of our offense toward God. That if he created man... And he is a God who so loved the world. And yet he still must condemn sinners to death and eternity in hell. That tells us just how serious our sin is. And so we can't just look at sin and say, oh, it's just a small thing. Oh, it was just one smoke or just one drink or it was just one cuss word or just using God's name in vain just one time. Or it was just a little white lie. Is that what we tend to do? No. As long as you belittle sin you'll continue in sin. But if you're going to move forward from sin, you've got to come to the place where you recognize just how offensive it is to God, that it is a serious violation of his law, and it carries the penalty of death and eternity in hell. We've got to recognize it for what it is if we're going to move forward. And that's why he's, uh, Moses is operating what seems so violently here. He's not being angry and sinning. He's being angry because of the way that God's glory is being destroyed by these people who claim his name. He's angry because of the way that they are bowing down before this calf, acting as though this gold that was fashioned by their own hands delivered them from Egypt when God went through great lengths to deliver them. And now all of a sudden they've just denied him. He is zealous for God's glory and therefore justified in his anger, and he casts those tables of stone down to make it clear, you need to recognize this is a problem. The next action that Moses takes here is that he is confronting Aaron with his personal responsibility in this sin. It says in uh, chapter 32 of Exodus and verse number 21, And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? He's saying, Aaron, I left you in charge. What did they do? Did they pin you down and hold a knife to your throat? Did Did they tie you up to a post and whip you? I mean, what did they do to you that caused you to make them this God? In verse 22, Aaron says, let not my Lord wax, uh, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. He says, hey, don't take it out on me. You know this people. He says, they are set on mischief. They're set. Aaron's acknowledging, you know this is a rebellious people. You know they don't care about what God thinks. You know their hearts are set on evil. You know they want to go back in Egypt. Here's what he's doing. Don't blame me. He's shifting the blame 
off himself onto other people. But then what he does is he absolves himself of any responsibility, and he does so in ridiculous fashion. As he says in, in verse number 24, uh, or verse 23, it says, For they said unto me, Make us gods that shall go before us. For As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. The people made me do it. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave him me, then I cast it into the fire, and there just pff, came out this calf. He says, Moses, I'm not responsible here. All, all I did, it was the people, they were mischievous, they wanted to do evil. All I said was, okay, go ahead and bring me all your gold, and I threw the gold in there, and boom, this calf just came out. I mean, this is a pretty ridiculous story. So ridiculous, Moses, Moses doesn't pay a lick of attention to it. <laughs> There is no response from Moses to this. What I want to point out is this. We all have this natural tendency that when we are confronted with our sin, we want to shift the blame. We want to minimize our sin and we want to absolve ourselves of all responsibility. When two kids are screaming and fighting at each other and you say, what's going on? What's the first thing they do? It was his fault. It was her fault. What do you do when you sit down with a married couple for counseling? What's going on here? She says it was his fault. He says it was her fault. When you have the issue at work and the DM comes in and says, why are you guys at each other's throat? Well, he did this and he did this and we're just pointing the finger at other people. Somebody might say, it's not my fault. Don't you know what big tech does these days? Don't you know the algorithms they have? Don't you know how they can, they can target men with temptation and target women with temptation? It's not my fault. It's big tech's fault. You ever heard this one before? The devil made me do it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've been guilty of this before. Not so uh, understandably at first. But when I was sophomore in college, I was driving on my way to work. I was a little bit late. I was going about... I kid you not, I was going about eight over the speed limit, you know, when I sat in my live at 25 class up in Fort Collins with police officers, they said, just keep it eight or under and you won't get pulled over. Just keep it within reason. I thought that's cops telling me this. And so that was the standard I lived by. So here in Colorado, I had only been pulled over like two or three times by the time I was 18. And uh, one time was going 32 over, you know, 45 on a back country road. You know what I got for that? A warning. By that officer's grace. There was another time I'd been pulled over going 15 over. I got a warning. But now I'm in Oklahoma. And here I'm going eight over the speed limit. Exactly what the police officer told me to do. And I see the lights come on. And he pulls me over. And, and he writes me a ticket. First time in Oklahoma getting pulled over. He writes me a ticket. And that ticket was $250 for eight miles an hour over the speed limit for something that's perfectly acceptable here. So I left, I pulled out my phone, I took a picture of that ticket, I posted it on my Facebook, and I said, the devil is fighting me hard today. <laughs> 250 for eight over in a 45? Are you kidding me? Please pray. That was before hashtags. Otherwise, there would have been a hashtag, woe is me. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, one of my tremendous godly college professors commented on it and said, wait a second. You're telling me that Satan himself stepped into your car by osmosis and he took possession of your leg and he pushed the pedal to the floor and made you go eight over the speed limit. If that's the case, you better check your salvation, bro. <laughs> I let needless to say, I was soundly rebuked. <laughs> and here's what God spoke to my heart about after that whole ordeal. There's enough rebel inside of me to go against God and to break the law without anybody else's help. And I submit to you tonight 
that there's enough rebel inside of you as well to make you go against God without the help of your spouse and without the help of your boss and without the help of the police and without the help of anybody else. And the reason why is because the hardness of our hearts, we are naturally bent to rebel against God. And as long as we point the fingers and as long as we minimize our sin and as long as we act like it's not that big a deal and try to absolve ourselves of responsibility, we will never be able to move forward or get victory over that sin. We must come to the place where we fully accept responsibility for our own actions. Until you do, you'll be stuck there. And that's what Moses is getting out of there and here. And it's what he's about to do with the entire nation is to come before him and say, hey, you've done wrong and it's time to own up. And you know what Aaron did? The people, not me, the calf just, boof. we think he's foolish. And yet what are our excuses? We've got to accept responsibility. The next thing that Moses does is he calls the entire nation together and he's calling them to turn from their sin and to return to the Lord. If you look at me at verse 25, he comes upon a naked people running wild, worshiping this calf. Verse 25, when Moses saw that the people were naked for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. What, what that means is this. Right after Aaron absolves himself the responsibility, the inspired Holy Spirit of God says, Moses, write this. Aaron did all this. Aaron made the people naked. Aaron brought them and led them into the situation. No, he's responsible. Verse 26, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? He's drawn a line in the sand and he's saying, who's going to continue to worship this calf? Who's going to continue in this nakedness and this debauchery and this wild party that you're throwing right now? And who's going to come back to the Lord? Who's going to turn from all that garbage and return to the Lord? Who's going to do it? And it says this, and all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. I just want to point something out here. It doesn't say nobody from any of the other tribes came. It doesn't say that. What it does say is it was only the tribe of Levi in which all the tribe came back. That's important. And the reason that's important is because up to this point, God has only established that Moses and Aaron and his sons will be a part of the priesthood. But what God is going to do is through the actions that the Levites are about to take, he is going to give them the special blessing of calling all of the Levites to be a part of the priestly service of the tabernacle. And the reason he's going to bless them in that way is because they are about to act very zealously for God's glory. They are about to prove themselves faithful to maintain order among the people spiritually. And so it says, all the Levites gathered themselves unto him, verse 27. And he said unto them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Understand, this isn't Moses' anger. This isn't Moses just flying off and taking action himself. No, he's received commandment from God. And what God tells him to do is he tells them to put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Whoa. I thought God was going to respond in grace. Now God's ordering them to go and kill everybody? That's what it says. But look at verse number 28. It says, And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Now understand, the tribe of Levi right now is tens of thousands at this point. 
The entire nation is about 2 million people. It says that there were 600,000 men of war, which have been 20 and upwards. So that's leaving out the women. That's leaving out uh, some of the old elderly. That's leaving out the kids. And so you're looking at a group of about tw- uh, 2 million people. You're looking at a tribe that probably had about 15 to 20,000 men. And you're telling me that they could only kill 3,000? What is this about? God did not order the death of everyone indiscriminately. When you look at verse 27, and it says that they were to go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, that is a Hebrew idiom for this, carefully and systematically. That they weren't to just go wild and start killing whoever they wanted. There was a speci- it's almost like it was a, a search that you're to go throughout the camp and you are to go from gate to gate. That's talking about house to house, tent to tent. And you are to go and you are to uh, choose a specific group of people that is to die. Well, who might that people be? What, what all the evidence points to is that it was the group who said, I'm not on the Lord's side. It was the group of people who, when confronted with their sin, said, no, I'm going to stay in my sin. I'm going to stay in my rebellion. I'm not going back to the Lord's side. And that number of people out of 2 million was about 3,000. And you're saying, whoa, God ordered the death of 3,000 people? Yes, he did. But for a second, let's consider the alternative. What if those 3,000 who have been warned and challenged and called to repent or else they would die with the sword at their side, said, no way, no how. I'm not going back to worshiping the Lord. I want to stay in the way that I'm worshiping right now. I want to continue to worship this pagan deity. I want to continue to go my way. If they were allowed to live, I wonder how many hundreds of thousands of people that group of 3,000 would have influenced away from the Lord. This people is proven to be easily influenced and turned away from God. And if that 3,000 people was allowed to live, it would have created an even bigger problem for the nation. But we've got to take a step back even further and take this from God's point of view. Because as God is looking at the people of Israel, he has chosen them for the express purpose of bringing the Savior into the world and blessing all the nations of the earth uh, through, with salvation through Jesus Christ. And if this nation walks away from God, then his plan is at stake and his glory is at stake. And he has a bigger purpose for this. And God in his zeal for all of humanity to be saved is unwilling to let 3,000 people, whom, by the way, in his infinite foreknowledge, already knows what they will do in the future. He's not willing to let them live and put all of humanity at risk. And therefore they were condemned. And God told the Levites, consecrate yourselves. What that really means is this. When you look up the literal words, fill your hands to the Lord. What that means is put your hands at God's disposal to do his work this day and God will put a blessing upon you. And God does because of their courageous zeal for God's holiness and God's glory. God is going to bless them by incorporating them into the priesthood and the sacrificial services of the tabernacle. But when you consider what this really was, it started with this. Moses standing in the gate of the entire camp and calling all the people together and saying this, who is on the Lord's side? He is confronting them with this reality They have turned away from God into sin. And if they're going to move forward from their sin, they need to turn back in God's direction. When you consider what Moses has done here, he has called them to the recognition of their sin. He has called them to accept responsibility for their sin. And he has called them to turn from their sin back to the Lord. You know what that is? What the Bible calls repentance. 
repentance. And if you're going to move forward from your sin, you must repent. You must come to the place where you recognize how severe your sin is against God. We're talking about whether you're saved or you're unsaved. Understand your lustful thoughts that you let run wild in your mind. Those are severely offensive to a holy God who knows your thoughts when no one else does. That adulterous affair is gravely offensive to God. That hatred and bitterness you harbor in your heart towards someone who hurt you in the past is deeply offensive to God when he's been willing to forgive you at the expense of his own son. All of our sin, we've got to recognize it for its severity before God. We've got to accept responsibility and stop shifting the blame and stop minimizing our sin and start accepting responsibility. And we've got to turn away from our sin back in God's direction. That is repentance, my friend. It's when you're driving down the left side of the highway and you see that big red sign that says wrong way. And you realize you're going the wrong way and you realize the destruction that's going to lie down the road ahead and your heart sinks a little bit because of it. And so what do you do? You pull off to the shoulder, you flip a U-E, you get back going the right direction. That's what repentance is. It's when God confronts you from his word. It may be through a preacher. It may be through a friend, a spouse, or family member. It may be from your pastor. It may be from a gospel invitation that somebody left on your door one day or left at your table one day or your desk one day. That what God was doing was he was putting a big red flashing light before you that tells you you are against God and you need to recognize it for the severity of what it is and you need to accept responsibility for it and you need to turn from it and turn back in God's direction And once you turn back in God's direction, once you deal with your sin, only then can you deal with your relationship with God. And that's exactly what Moses does next. If you look in your Bibles at verse number 30, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. He's not minimizing it. He's calling it out for what it is. It is a great sin. And so he says, uh, uh, now, uh, now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. He's saying the only hope of God not destroying your nation is if I go before him and offer an atoning sacrifice. That's the only hope you have. And so he says in verse number 31, and Moses returned unto the Lord. Now Moses has left the camp and he is headed back up into the mountain and he himself has returned to the Lord. And he says this, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made gods of gold. He acknowledges it himself as being a clear violation of God's word. And he says in verse 32, Yet now, if thou wilt, forgive their sin. God They have sinned. And once again, he is appealing to God's grace. And he's asking him, please, of your grace and your mercy, forgive this people of their sin. But then he says this, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Understand this is not talking about the Lamb's book of life from the book of Revelation because that is one that your name is written into when you place your faith in Jesus Christ. And once your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, it can never be blotted out again. That's an impossibility. But in the Old Testament, they often, including David, including others, will often refer to the book of the living. And what it means is this, that the moment that God creates an individual in the womb, the moment that a person is born that God records their name. He knows you by name before you were even born. He already had your name written on a record. But when death happens is when your name is blotted out. You're no longer in the book of the living. This is simply referring, here's what Moses is saying. God, if it's your will, forgive their sin. And if not, take my life. Take my life. When Moses said, I'm going to go to the Lord, I'm going to perhaps 
offer an atonement for you. He wasn't saying, I'm going to go and offer an animal sacrifice. He wasn't saying, I'm just going to go and shed the blood of a lamb. He said, I will go and I will offer my own blood as an atonement for sin. His thought is that perhaps God will accept the death of one for the life of all. He says, I'll do it. The reason why is because God has said, Moses, step to the side. I'm going to wipe them all out and I'm going to keep you. And he's thinking it may just be that if God is willing to take all their lives in exchange for mine, maybe God will take my life in exchange for theirs. And he's thinking maybe that's how God works. But notice God's response. It says in verse 32 or 33, And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. What he's saying is this, Moses, I can't accept your atonement. It's not good enough. Because every single person who sins will ultimately face the penalty of death. Question, was Moses a sinner? Moses was a murderer. He killed that Egyptian man. Moses was absolutely a sinner. And what that means is this, because Moses has to face the penalty of death for himself, he can't face the penalty of death for all the people. He's got his own problems. And so God tells him in verse 34, go lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. What he's saying there is, Moses, I'm not going, I'm not leading you anymore. This people is wicked. This people is godless. I'm not leading them. Instead, I'm going to send my angel. We don't for certain know all the certainty of who this angel is. Some see it as a, as a, a Jesus Christ reincarn, or in a pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ. I, I tend to not necessarily agree with that because what you see in the scriptures is they're looking at this. The angel of the Lord is far inferior to God himself. And Jesus is simply not that. They don't want the angel to lead them. They're unwilling to go without God's presence. But what this is meant to show us and to foreshadow is this. Because of their sin, they're at a distance from God. And not only are they at a distance from God, they are left to face his chastening hand. God says, nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. That word visit, it means to visit in the sense of judgment. He says, I'll visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf, which Aaron made. I thought God was going to respond in grace. Indeed, he is. Because God has already told the people when he gave them the law that if anybody makes an idol of gold, they're to be put to death. This word plague literally means to cause injury. And it stands in opposition to death. That when God would have been justified according to the law to claim the life of all who had sinned against him, instead, God chastened them with some sort of temporary plague. Rather than destroying them, he just simply injured them. And that is his grace. And what it's meant to show us is this that though God may forgive our sin, and though God may not give us what we truly deserve, it doesn't mean that we can't ever be at a distance from him and that we can't ever sense his chastening hand upon our lives. No, that's exactly what sin brings to us as his people. But I want to consider something here. And that's this fact. That though God would not accept Moses' offer of atonement, the reality is that the atonement of one for all was God's plan. But Moses was not God's man. There was another man who would come. A man who would be sinless. A man who would be a lamb without spot and without blemish. 
And so God gave Moses the sacrificial system and the priesthood to show that it must be a spotless lamb without blemish, that his blood must be sprinkled upon the altar and sprinkled upon the mercy seat to atone for their sins, to establish a right relationship with them. But the book of Hebrews tells us that all of those sacrifices were simply shadows and pictures and figures that pointed to an individual who would be sinless, who would be a lamb as without spot and without blemish, and that that man would die for the sins of the people, that there was only one man who would come and would be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. There would only be one man who as a lamb would be led like a sheep to the slaughter. There was only one man upon whom God would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. There was only one man who through the stripes that he received brought us peace between us and God. There was only one man and that man was Jesus Christ. Would you go to Romans chapter 5? Romans chapter 5, and it's, it's written so plainly and so clearly here that I just feel we have to look at it so that you can see it, not from my mouth, but from God's word. Romans chapter 5, and I want you to look at verse number 6. It says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Look down at verse number 17. For if by one man's offense, speaking of Adam, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. You know what this text teaches us? God's plan was one man's blood for the atonement of all mankind, but that man could not be Moses for he was a sinner. But Jesus came as the sinless son of God who completely fulfilled the law of God without spot, without blemish and hung on a cross and shed his blood and laid down his life. And when God saw the sacrifice that Jesus offered by his own life, he determined that all who place their faith in what Jesus had done for them would receive the forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Christ, and therefore the atonement of one man can be applied to all of humanity by faith in Jesus Christ. It was his plan all along. See, sin keeps us at a distance from God, and it leaves behind it a devastating path. When you have sin in your life, you don't feel close to God. You feel too guilty to pray, too ashamed to open a Bible, too embarrassed to go to church to worship, and the Holy Spirit presses upon you the reality that you are at a distance from God because you're in rebellion to God. And what you need is this, for somebody to be able to take away your sin and cleanse you of the guilt and clear you of the shame and, and, and relieve you of all the consequences so that you can leave your sin behind and go forward in a reconciled and restored relationship with God. And in this text, what God is giving you 
is the path forward from sin. As he's dealing with Israel here, Moses leads Israel forward from sin by calling them to repentance and by seeking reconciliation through the atonement of the sacrifices. That's what it's leading to. And what it means for you and I today is that the only way for you to move forward from sin into a restored relationship with God is by repenting of your sin and by seeking reconciliation through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That is the only path forward from sin. It's not religion. It's not your goodness. It's not your charity. There's nothing other than Jesus that can atone for your sin. And so what this means is that whether or not you're saved, you need Jesus. But if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, understand your sin separates you from God and it leaves you to face not only the uh, devastating results of sin, but the eternal judgment of God for your sin. But God has revealed in his word that if you will uh, repent of your sin, that if you will uh, recognize the severity of your sin before God, and if you'll accept responsibility for your sin, and if you'll turn away from your sin and turn to the Lord, then God promises that when you place your faith Faith in the atoning death of Jesus Christ, he promises to wipe your sin clean. He promises to forgive you, to release you from all charges. He promises to credit you with the righteousness of Jesus Christ by the obedience of one man, life shall reign to all mankind. Now, when you trust in Jesus, God declares you righteous, which is what the word justify means. He treats you just as if you had never sinned before. And the only reason why is because you have accepted your sin for what it is and you have turned to faith in Christ and trusted in him exclusively for salvation. And when you do, you can move forward from sin in a restored and reconciled relationship with God through Jesus. But the same thing really applies to us who already are saved. We can't be blotted out of the book of life, but we can be at a distance from God. And we can be under the chastening hand of God when we sin. And what that distance and that chastening is designed to do in our lives is to confront us with the seriousness of our sin. It is to confront us with the responsibility of our sin. And it is to call us to turn from our sin back to our good and gracious Father, who when we turn back to him and confess our sins through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, he welcomes us back like a father does his children when they return to him. That's the only path forward is repentance and reconciliation through Jesus Christ. So where are you at today? Have you accepted him as your savior? Or have you been trusting in your own religion? Have you been trusted in your own giving? Trusting in your own moral goodness? Well, here's the reality. If God has said, the only way is my son, all of your religious attempts to save yourself is still in and of itself rebellion against God. He said, my son's the only way. And you're saying, no, I want to go do it my own way. And it starts with recognizing that I'm in rebellion. I cast off trusting in myself and I turn in faith to the only one whom God looked at as he suffered and said, my wrath against sin is satisfied. You've got to trust him and him alone. And believer tonight, if you found a trail of devastation behind you because of sin, there is a path forward. You don't have to stay there. Through Christ, you can come back. And through Christ, you can move forward. And through Christ, you can be restored to a right relationship with God. Would you follow the path forward from sin tonight? Our Father, we come before you thankful that your word shows us the path 
back to you. And I pray for all in here tonight who have not yet accepted Christ as their Savior. Oh God, I pray that they would make that decision even tonight. Would trust exclusively in what Jesus has done for our sin. And I pray for those who may be wandering, perhaps running wild in ways that nobody even knows about. I pray that they would get on the path forward that they would recognize their sin, accept responsibility for their sin, turn from their sin, and seek reconciliation through Christ. Would you please work? In Jesus' name I pray, amen.